All right, so my presentation is a quick overlook of part of this project that is this you know, symposium here today. We've also conducted a qualitative study with interviews with experts. So this is what my presentation will be about. So we conducted the semi-structured interviews between November of last year, January this year. We have um, experts, both from the AI ex experts and also AI ethics experts. And then we have one uh, participant that characterized as having both expertises. So we have a total of 14. And the way that we recruit these people, we use you know, ethics models, uh, data generation projects, ethics core of the NIH bridge to AI program. We also use other related NIH uh, initiatives that might have also uh, have a focus on the AI. Uh, we look at the invited keynote speakers of conferences that were relevant, as well as authors of peer review publications. And trust me, it is hard to get people to say yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so this is our sample. Um, you know, most of our sample were 36 to 45 uh, years old. Uh, most of them were non-Latino white, so no, no big surprises. Um, we tried to at least have a little bit of diversity. Um, and most people came from uh, medical schools. There was uh, more the better distribution between people with less than 10 years of experience and people with more than 10 years of experience. All right, so I already mentioned that you know, we conducted these uh, interviews. Uh, they were by Zoom, because these people were from all across uh, the states. Um, and we asked them, of course, a number of sociodemographic questions, but then the substantive questions were based on two different parts. So the first part were questions about synthetic data and LC issues around synthetic data in the biomedical context. And then the second part was focused on LC-focused computational checklists. So I'll try to go quick uh, and highlight some of the, the main takeaways. So to start, the familiarity. So even though these were experts in the AI domain, uh, most people, when it comes to synthetic data, they felt they have substantial uh, familiarity with it. But when it comes, but you also see that some people have minimal. And that was because they didn't consider themselves as they might have heard of it, but they haven't really used it. And so it was, you can see that the familiarity was spread throughout. Um, substantial to minimal. But with computational checklists, uh, most people have heard of checklists, but when really come with LC focused computational checklists, uh, minimal to none. So most of our sample, they, they didn't have any familiarity with those type of checklists. All right, so attit attitudes around synthetic data. Overall, these were positive, but uh, most participants were also cautionary. So, for example, here's one of the um, quotes from one of the AI experts saying, well, synthetic data is not a solution for everything. Believe, uh, I believe there are a lot of use cases where you still need the source data. It is a tool in our toolbox. It's not the tool. It is a tool. And then another one, another AI expert says, it's not going to fix like whatever is wrong with real data. So it's not some magic tool to fix, for example, small sample sizes or rare diseases. So they see the benefits and the opportunities that synthetic data can bring, but they also were very much aware of, you know, this is not a panacea. So some of the opportunities that people mentioned, the representativeness of the data, uh, its viability as it prevents some regulatory burdens uh, that exist with real data, like, you know, IRB processes and things like that. Um, its potential to reduce costs, which can translate into wider access. Um, but one that, uh, at least for me, caught my attention is like the, the mention of like this could be really good for educational opportunities, especially in the biomedical setting. So being able to generate some kind of synthetic data set which accurately reflects, or accurately as close as possible, some of the challenges of real data sets. And that's super helpful, right? So a uh, couple of participants, especially AI experts, mentioned that as a great opportunity. And then the participant that um, characterizes having both expertise says, I think there is an opportunity for providing people with the look and feel of real data before they start working with it. So they, they see this as a very good opportunity uh, for in synthetic data spaces. Um, all right, some of the challenges. So how to ensure data is accurate and reliable? So we have already heard some of these challenges. 
How do we make appropriate risk benefits calculations? How do we bring together into collaborations the wide range of stakeholders needed for synthetic data to reach its potential? And how we communicate with the general public? So that's another thing that was brought by our participants. Like, you know, people, you talk, uh, tell them synthetic data and they're gonna go like, what are you talking about? So, and that could really impact the trust into using this uh, in the biomedical setting. And so you hear just one quote from one of the AI experts. One of the biggest challenges might be, how do we know when a synthetic data set is good? So where are the metrics for success here? So I thought that would really capture uh, an important challenge in this space. There were obviously a lot of discussion uh, went around privacy and biases when we talk about the LC issues. Uh, so, you know, I think that a big part of the attractiveness of data mining in general is profiling. And this is the part that I'm not sure that synthetic data can mitigate. So again, there are benefits in terms of, yeah, it can help us with privacy and bias, but it's not gonna solve it necessarily. So there was a lot of acknowledgement of that part. And again, here from another AI expert, it says, I think it's a mistake to think of simulated data as inherently promoting or averting bias, but it could be used to do either. Bad uses could certainly exacerbate them, good uses could diminish them. Um, so, a lot of participants also talk about how the synthetic data can exacerbate structural injustices and harms, that it doesn't adequately represent the phenomenon that it's trying to um, understand, um, you know, mistaking synthetic data for actual data. So that was an interesting uh, concern, again, that it, people would think it's real data and that what would be the consequences of that. Uh, not having a clear understanding of what synthetic data is and the long-term implications and concerns about accountability and uh, legal liability issues, as um, Glenn mentioned earlier. So that was interesting to hear from non-legal experts, but still knowing that this is coming, You're just not knowing how that's gonna, you know, pan out. Also, a lot of discussion about power distribution, how some groups benefit, how others not. There were a couple of people that mentioned environmental um, costs and, and trust. That was certainly also an important thing. Uh, in terms of policy, you know, having incentives that are transparent op and open and having standards and policy specifics to the biomedical domain. So all of these things, the different speakers have touched uh, in one way or another. Uh, in terms of oversight, you know, who should be involved, right? In terms of who should over have oversight of over synthetic data? Is it the role of the IRB? Is it funders? So again, not a uh, clear agreement here. Uh, here just one quote saying, I think that by and large the people that serve on institutional review boards as well as sort of the regulatory climate in which the IRBs operate are completely unable to cope with sort of modern data science methods, including synthetic data. Maybe we need a data science IRB for projects that are primarily data science where we actually have experts to understand sort of the risks and benefits. So many of our participants were clear about this, that there's something there that needs to be done if we want IRBs to have oversight. All right, so let me quickly transition to LC focused computational checklists. So we use these definitions. So these are checklists that are intended to provide a way of ensuring a set of steps were um, uh, considered and are completed to provide a check on the robustness of an algorithm process and its outputs. Some of our participants, in terms of you know what sort of elements this checklist should have, talk about you know how do we uh, check that the provenance of, of the data, transparency about the features and decisions involved, th things related to validation and testability. Some people even say, well, are, aren't all of these elements just part of good data stewardship? Um, we talk a lot in our interviews about the benefits of this type of checklist versus the challenges. So some of the benefits would be like, well, just even be, be able to establish a baseline to have these conversations, right? Especially developers might not be really familiar with the type of issues or really thinking about LC at all. So having this checklist could be a way to get them uh, to start. Uh, and in terms of challenges, you know, people say, well, this could be seen as ethics washing. People just think like checking the box is gonna be enough when it's not. And how do we make them, you know, comprehensible, compact, scalable and adaptable checklist, which is kind of what would be needed for this to be deployed and that there are already many available. So how do we prioritize which ones to use? 
So here I just have this quote that says, you know, ethics checklists for computation could be useful. So there was an agreement that they could be useful. But there's a part of me that also feels like a big part of ethics is different from surgery. In that the ethical issues or like the ethics don't stop at the checklist, right? So ethics is something that's sort of ongoing. And the checklist almost sort of like circumscribes in a way that I think can be a little bit limiting. So they could be good for establishing a baseline, but they shouldn't be where discussion of ethics stops. So many of our participants did have this view. We also talk al about barriers you know, to honors for developers to implement and follow them, issues about misinterpretation, an agreement of the terms that should be included in the list, you know, even the tendency to define checklist requirements less on their efficacy and utility and more on the consensus of a committee, um, which could be problematic depending on the diversity of that committee. And then the broader acceptance and education would also would, uh, would could potentially could be a barrier. Uh, so who should enforce them? Again, another important question. Is that you know, publishers? Is it funders? Like who should enforce them? Again, no clear answer there. Uh, and who should create them? Right? I think here there was a little bit more consensus that it really needs a, a diversity of perspectives, including bioethicists, lawyers, developers, even patients um, should be included. And with that, uh, thank you.